thank you very much uh, for coming to sit joint uh, <laughs> seminar between the Digital Initiative and the uh, uh, Tom Unit, and it, it's a pleasure that we were able to do this. Um, uh, uh, we have a new crowd, a little bit of a mix of crowds. So why don't we go around the room real quick, um, just have everyone introduce themselves and their affiliation. So I'm Shane Greenstein uh, from uh, the uh, Tom Unit and one of the co-directors of the Digital Initiative. I'm Jose Lopez, I'm a PhD student at Sloan in System Dynamics, and I'm interested in behavioral labs. Um, my name is Samuel Fresh, I'm at the Liberal Work Life Program at the Law School. I'm interested in automation and the enterprise. I'm uh, Chiara Faronato, and I'm uh, here at Harvard Business School of Technology and Operations Management. I'm Susie from Power Economic Power. I'm Hugo, I'm a fellow of MIT, interested in data privacy and digital technology. I'm uh, Tian Shu from uh, USC, and I'm visiting uh, MIT this uh, semester. I'm Shengya in marketing here. I'm interested in sharing company, and I graduated from CSU. Uh, Louis Shi, and I'm Leslie John in the non unit, and also a senior. Thank you. Yeah, both of you have the Tom unit. Good afternoon, I'm Liz Alton. I'm a strategy professor at UMass Lowell and I study platform group. Right, Angle, I'm a, a professor in strategy. I'm Jerry Kane, I'm a professor at Boston College and a visiting scholar here in the Tom Dave Rama, director of the David Thomas with the Digital Initiative. Diane Williams, computer scientist, uh, ed tech entrepreneur, alumna of MIT Sloan and Harvard. Hi, I'm Ryan Gould. I'm a PhD student in the Digital Economics at HBS. I'm Jerry Kane. I'm a PhD student in Digital Economics at Harvard Business School. I'm a joint degree student in Digital Economics at HBS. I'm Ryan. I'm a talk student in Digital Economics at HBS. I'm Luke. I'm a PhD student in Digital Economics at HBS. Hi, I'm Tommy. Uh, PhD student. Okay, and, and it's our great pleasure to have Lori Crane with us here today. Uh, just as an introduction, uh, we should say she holds multiple chairs, and they're too long to say. And, uh, uh, but she's the director of the SciLab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory. That's her present. Um, I know Lori um, in a different way. I know her as a co-editor of a book. Uh, one of the first books I ever edited, and um, I also know her as um, uh, just a wonderfully multi-talented individual. The cover of this book is something Lori made. That is a um, right. Oh, were, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. And you flip it around, and then this tie, which is, is just among my favorite ties, is also something Lori designed. It is, a, it is material designed around bad passwords. Yeah. <laughs> Among my favorite tasks. Take it away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, you know, I had to uh, come up with a title and abstract for this talk a while ago, and I knew I wanted to talk about uh, something having to do with privacy notices and consents and all the complications of doing them uh, you know, with all these new privacy laws and IoT, and so, yeah, that's the title you get. Um, the actual content of the talk, uh, as you will see, includes um, work that I've been involved with um, over like the past 15 years or so. Um, you know, the, so there's stuff from 15 years ago and there is stuff from last week uh, at the end, um, which uh, is really exciting and why I'm a little frazzled um, as you feel like the end of the story. Um, but let's start going, uh, here we'll, we'll go back to, this was published in 2008, which means we did it in 2007. Um, uh, and uh, so this is, this is work that, that I did with um, Alicia McDonald, who um, graduated a long time ago at this point, um, and is now actually on the CMU faculty. Uh, so Alicia came into my office one day and she said, uh, you know, I want to do a little study and find out what would happen if people read all the privacy policies at all the websites they visit. And I said, Alicia, don't be ridiculous, that won't happen. And, and Alicia said, well, yeah, I know it won't happen, but like, just, just imagine that it would happen. How long would it take them to do that? 
okay, well, this is an empirical thing we, we could test. So uh, Alicia went and gathered data about website privacy policies. Um, she looked at how long they were. She looked at their readability. Uh, she gathered data about how many different websites American internet users visit in a month. Um, she gathered data about adult American reading speed. Um, she crunched all the numbers. And she discovered it would take you 244 hours per year, on average. Um, and uh, so this, this paper, um, I mean, people are still citing it. Well, actually, what's more interesting than it's getting cited in the literature is that the press continues to cite it half the time wrong. They have all sorts of other numbers that are not in the paper. But 244 is, is I mean, there, are, there are several numbers in the paper, but this is the main one. Um, but the thing is, 244 hours per year reading privacy policies, and that's painful. Um, it's one policy or multiple policies? What? That time. Yeah. It's just for one policy? No, 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 no. This is if you were to read the policy at every website you visit. Yeah, oh my gosh. If you spent 244 hours on one policy, like, yeah, you could like commit it to memory, but um, <laughs> no, no, no. If you were if you were going to actually read, um, you know, every policy you know, on the website you visit, that's how much time you would spend. Um, and you know, I study privacy policies, and I don't think I spend 244 hours per year reading them. Uh, I go nuts. Um, and um, and so if we assume that in order to protect privacy in the United States because we don't really have very many privacy laws, people have to read the privacy policies and file complaints or whatever. I, I mean, this just demonstrates that this is unworkable. That this, this could not work. Um, and that was the point here, was not that we think anybody does this, but to show how ridiculous it would be to expect that this would actually happen. Um, and, you know, and in the paper, we compare that to how much time people spend doing various other things. And you know, cl clearly, this is, does not actually happen. <laughs> now we're getting nothing. My laptop has decided it's just not gonna. Very odd. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So um, here, here's an example of just one privacy policy. Um, this, is, this is a real company, but I took their name off. Um, but if you squint at it, you can see who they are. Um, and uh, yes, it is that long. And this is not an outlier. Um, you know, there are a lot of privacy policies that are, in fact, that long. And so, you know, clearly, uh, this is this is part of the problem. Yeah. Do you have any measurement about how long? It takes for a company to draft this up, just like a template, or like how much money do they spend on legal consulting and like internal work? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I have no data. Um, I have anecdotes. Um, so I used to work for AT and T uh, before I came to academia, and um, so I have some sense of the effort they put into it. I've also been hired um, by some companies uh, as a consultant on their privacy policies. Um, I think a lot of companies, it's a very short thing. If they can find another company with a similar policy that they can start with that and just kind of tweak it, they do it. Um, but then there are some companies that actually invest a lot of time and effort. Um, there was one company that I was consulting with, a, a very large company, um, that said they wanted to do something really different with their privacy policy and make it very accessible. And we talked about all sorts of ideas and graphics, and it was going to be really cool. And I came up with some drafts. and. Um, uh, we, I mean, we basically worked on it for two years, back and forth and back and forth, and in the end they abandoned the project, and they still have their old, long, boring privacy policy. Um, yeah, so they just, they just couldn't do it. <laughs> it was just, it was just, you know, some people in the company wanted it, and some of the lawyers were like, no. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so um, anyway, uh, the, this notion that having people read privacy policies is not an original statement from me. This was a White House report from 2014, and I love their wording. Only in some fantasy world do users actually read these things. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's kind of like well known that we have this policy solution that we know won't actually work. And then we have Internet of Things devices. 
All right, so it's bad enough getting people to read privacy policies on web pages. You know, what are you supposed to do? Like, look at your smart light bulbs and the drones flying by and find their privacy policy? Like, they're all collecting data about you. They may be collecting actually way more data than, than those web pages, and it's, there's really no way to, to get their privacy policies. So, uh, more evidence that it's unworkable. Um, but, you know, I, I, I want to not just. Um, uh, point out problems. I'd like to help solve them. Uh, so what can we actually do so that we can, um, I actually don't really care if people read these things, but I want people to actually have some control over their personal information. Um, and then there's some other things going on uh, which, which mean we need, we need to, or to me, mean we need to act. Uh, so one, as I said, is, is that we have the Internet of Things and so the problem is getting worse. Um, but also, we have legislation. Um, so GDPR and in, in, in Europe and in California, CCPA, and there are many others, but these are the two big ones right now. Um, legislation that requires some transparency about privacy. Um, in particular, GDPR has language including that uh, you need to have transparent and easily accessible policies in an intelligible form using clear and plain language. Uh, well, if any of you have ever tried to figure out how to do that with a privacy policy, that's actually not very easy to do. Um, if, if you spend enough time at it, like I said, I've done for some companies, you, you can do it, but their lawyers may or may not go along with it. Um, and then the CCPA also says that your policy needs to be designed and presented in a way that is easy to read and understandable to consumers. Um, so basically, it's in the air. We've got to make these things easy and clear and all of that, uh, but very little guidance about how to actually do it. So uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. So I've already talked about kind of the limitations of what, of what we have right now. Um, I'm going to talk about why we should do this, why privacy notice and consent can actually be useful despite the limitations that we've seen. Um, I'm going to talk about going beyond the traditional privacy policy. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the research we're doing at CMU, specifically in the privacy and security for IoT space. Um, and then the stuff that I've been doing the past few weeks on um, privacy choices for websites, and uh, then leave you with some final thoughts. Okay, so how these things can be useful. Um, so in the United States, where we have um, minimal and mostly state and sector specific privacy legislation, most of our privacy enforcement is coming from the Federal Trade Commission, some also from state attorney generals. And it's not that they are enforcing privacy laws for the most part, but actually they are looking at um, uh, protecting consumers against fraudulent and deceptive practices. So uh, if you say in your privacy policy that you have great privacy, you're not going to sell consumers data, blah, 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 and you do something contrary to that, well, that's either fraudulent or deceptive, and the FTC can go after you, even though it's not violating a privacy law per se. So um, this requires, though, that the companies make an affirmative statement about what their privacy policy is. If they don't say what their policy is, then you can't get them for contradicting their policy. So this is a reason why we want companies to be transparent. Even if nobody reads it, we want to get it there on their website um, so we can find that statement when we want to accuse them of doing something bad on privacy. Okay. Um, another reason that we want to have these statements is that sometimes there are actual choices available to you if you go read the policies, and we want consumers to be able to find the choices and exercise them. Uh, some of them are very easy to find, like right big top of the page, choice and opt out. Some of them you actually have to read through, you know, about eight pages of the policy before you find it buried in the tiny text. Uh, we prefer them to be pulled out and easier to find. Um, another thing is that even though most uh, sane humans will not read privacy policies. There are some insane humans who will. Um, <laughs> whether they are researchers or journalists uh, who will go and find interesting things in privacy policies and then let the world know about them. 
Um, and then uh, that gets publicity. And sometimes companies will make changes after they get the bad publicity. Or sometimes the FTC or the state attorney generals will go and investigate them. Um, but but there, there are kind of watchdogs out there who will read these things. And then there are also privacy tools, uh, including a number of browser tools. So this one is Ghostery. That's actually a pretty old version of Ghostery. But um, you can get uh, browser plugins uh, that, um, for the most part, they don't read the whole policy, but they can look at things like third-party cookies and give you some indication about the kind of tracking that's going on on the website automatically without you having to go read anything. OK, so uh, if we want to go beyond traditional privacy policies, which it seems is probably the way to go if we want people to actually read and understand things, because uh, you know, 20 pages, you know, people are just not going to read them. Um, we've done some work thinking about what else can you do with privacy policies. And so in 2015, uh, I worked with uh, Florian Schaub, who's now at the University of Michigan, and uh, Rebecca Balibaco, um, and Adam Duarte, who are both now at Google, uh, but they were at CMU at the time. Um, and we came up with this privacy notice design space. Um, and so basically, we have four axes here. Uh, I'm not going to go through it in full detail, but just at the, at the high level, um, one question about privacy notices is when do you present them to people? Uh, so sort of the obvious thing is when you land on a website, when you set up a device, you should see the privacy policy before you do anything, um, which seems very logical, uh, except for the fact that people generally are not in the mood to see a privacy policy, that they're, they're ready to get started and use that new electronic doorbell or whatever it is. They don't want to spend time reading a privacy policy. Um, so another approach is to say just in time. So at the time the thing is ready to collect your data, it should tell you what, what it's doing. And maybe not the whole policy, maybe just the policy about that bit of data it's collecting right now. Um, you can also have context dependent. It depends how you're using something. Different bits of the privacy policy will be shown to you. Uh, you might see things periodically. You might get a reminder. Um, there may be some persistent thing in the corner, like the, the recording light on a camera. Um, or it may be just be on demand. It's that link at the bottom of the page that you don't have to ever look at, but it's there if you want it. Right, so lots of different timings. Yeah? Yeah, I don't think there would be room for some sort of um, external party to come in and be able to rate the privacy policies of websites. Yeah. Sort of good housekeeping seal. <laughs> there, yeah, there, there have been various efforts to do that. Um, not successful, or? Um, well, so it turns out it takes a long time to read them. So it, you have to like pay a lot of people to read them in order to rate them. <laughs> and then people said, well, why don't we just have a computer do it? Right? So we actually had a project at CMU where we thought we would uh, you know, just use machine learning and natural language processing and you know, read them all. And uh, yeah, we discovered, actually, it's really hard. Um, because privacy policies are somewhat vague. Um, yeah, we, I, so we, we actually did a project where um, we thought, well, before we can uh, test the, our algorithms, we need to have the ground truth on these policies. So we, um, we, we took a bunch of policies and we said, we're going to have mechanical Turk workers uh, read them and answer some questions about them. Um, so we just, we, I think we had nine questions we wanted to answer about each policy. So we sent it out to Turkers. We sent like each policy to like eight Turkers or something. And the answers were all over the place. They, they, there was very little agreement. And we did, all right, well, Turkers are lazy and they're not trained to do this. So we, uh, we went down the street to the Pitt Law School and we had got some law students to do this. And they were terrible also. And we're like, well, well, Pitt's not the best law school, but still, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're pretty good, and, and these students seem pretty competent. You're know, like, what's going on here? Um, so we had we had some actual law professors do it, and they didn't agree either. So then we got the, the professors to talk to each other about why they didn't agree, and and it basically it came down to these policies are actually vague, and they each had reasonable but different interpretations of what the policy actually. So that suggests to me that the market doesn't care enough to pay for something, because you could say, if you had this external agency, then maybe they would have some sort of templates 
that people would, the companies would fill out and then you could assess them? Well, there, there also have been efforts to have templates. Uh, I, I spent, I spent a, a good seven years of my life working on that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, it, the, it, getting, getting companies to agree to follow it without being forced to by regulators is, is a hard and unsolved problem. Yeah. I'm curious, are you envisioning this as like um, kind of a, every time you, a company can collect your data, you would get some kind of notice? Or would there be space for like an overarching, because I'm thinking of like just fatigue of <laughs> answering these questions and choosing all the time. So could you use this in a way that like there's kind of some overarching preference stated? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, one of the things which I'll talk about uh, later is that wouldn't it be nice if you had a computer program that could you know, read all this and you could tell it up front, these are the things you want, and you could go about your life and not worry about it and it would you know, alert you if you are doing business with a company that crossed certain lines or you were walking into a room that had cameras or whatever that, you know, whatever. Um, yes, automation is good. This will come up a few times. Um, I, I think, you know, skipping to one of the punchlines, ultimately the only way this scales is with some automation. Um, we just don't have enough time and, you know, energy to spend all day reading <coughs> privacy policies, even if they're really short. Um, I think, though, even with a lot of automation, at some point, you're going to run into something you haven't seen before. There isn't a rule for it, and you're going to have to pay some attention. And sometimes it's not so much you making the choice to allow or not to allow, but being aware of what's happening. So right now, I know that my lecture is being recorded. Okay? There are certain things I'm not going to say as a result. Right? I, but something has to make me aware of that. I signed a consent form. <laughs> Was there a question about it? Yeah. I know you don't like into full details. I'm just very curious what haptic privacy is. Ah, uh, that, that is vibrations. Your phones vibrate. Yeah, okay. So uh, you could imagine that if you, I walk into a room with some sort of data collection I don't like, there would be a certain type of vibration my phone would have in my pocket or my watch would vibrate or whatever so that I would know maybe I want to turn around and go out that door right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, I'm not going to go through all the boxes here, but you see besides the timing, there's a channel. Um, so uh, the primary channel is on the device itself. I'm, on, I'm using a laptop. The privacy policy for the website is on the laptop. Secondary would be I'm using a Fitbit. It doesn't have a screen, but I use my phone to sync my Fitbit so I can read the privacy policy on my phone. Um, and then public is like a sign on the wall. Um, and then uh, modality, we, we can see, we can hear, we can shake, um, or maybe it's machine readable, and that gets transmitted to whatever device I'm using, and it can display it to me in whatever language or form I want. And I can choose what language, I can choose whether I want just a few little symbols, I want the short summary, or whether I want the long thing. Um, or maybe I choose... Um, hey, look, you know, I, I really am upset about video cameras, and so if there's any video camera nearby, like, tell me about it, and otherwise, just don't even bother me. Um, and then control, uh, there's a question of, uh, with these notices, are they, uh, you know, are, are they um, blocking that, you know, before I can proceed, I need to actually consent or make a choice? Um, or is it something that anytime I want, I can go and change a setting, but it doesn't, I don't have to. There's some default setting that will be there even if I don't um, touch it. Um, or, or, you know, completely decoupled from, from the experience. Right, so that's the design space, and we've been um, kind of playing around with different elements at different points in the design space. Um, so here are some examples that I've found of interesting approaches to privacy notices. Um, so, uh, Privacyville came from an online game company, um, and, uh, you know, it's clever. They, they, have, they have flash games, why not have a flash privacy policy? Um, 
My opinion is that it's actually pretty awful, but, but nice try. <laughs> nice concept. I don't think it really worked. Um, <laughs> uh, below that, we have uh, Google has a traditional privacy policy, but they actually have a whole series of like 30 second or one minute videos about different parts of their privacy policy. So if instead of reading it, you would rather um, you know, watch the Google privacy policy film series, uh, you can. <laughs> They're cute. Um, um, then uh, icons. Lots of projects, the ideas have icons. Um, the, this phone up here has some icons that were developed as part of a U.S. Department of Commerce multi-stakeholder process on app transparency, which was also a complete fiasco, but um, yeah, they tried. Um, and uh, oh, and by the way, the reason it was a complete fiasco is that they had a plan to get together multi-stakeholder people to design essentially a privacy notice, a short privacy notice for apps. So they asked companies and government agencies to send people, and they all pretty much sent lawyers. And they, they sat around, and they came up with this thing. And then somebody said, hey, does anybody know anything about user testing and what users want? And um, Actually, the only person there who did was my PhD student, uh, who was sitting in on this, uh, who was eager to do some user testing. And they thought maybe they'd take up a collection and hire somebody to do some user testing. Uh, but by the time they got around to it, they realized they couldn't actually agree on what they were testing and what their actual objective was. So they didn't do the testing. And so my PhD student did it herself. I allocated $1,000 to the task. Um, which is not very much, but it was enough to see clearly that it, that it completely sucked, basically. <laughs> um, and by that point, they decided to declare victory and end the working group in, with success, but it basically hasn't been adopted. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, uh, Trustee Certified Privacy. So Trustee is an organization, they used to be a nonprofit, but they are now um, part of TrustArc, which is a for-profit uh, company, and they do a privacy seal. So basically they have templates for privacy policies. You can pay them to go uh, review your policy, review your practices. Uh, you get to put their, the seal on your website. If somebody thinks you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you can complain to trustee. Trustee will come and audit you and check stuff out. And this has been going on for like 20 years um, with mixed success, I would say. Um, a, lot of, a lot of big companies use it. Uh, a lot of small companies use it because they figure nobody trusts them. So if they put the word trustee on their site, maybe people will trust them more. Um, but they've also gotten a lot of bad press because um, there are companies that have their seal that do bad things on privacy all the time. And um, just because companies do bad things on privacy all the time. And, uh, and it doesn't appear that trustee is actually doing anything. Uh, behind the scenes, actually, I think trustee is doing a lot of things, but it's very difficult to be visible to the public about what they're doing. And a lot of the things that companies are doing that are bad about privacy don't actually violate their agreement with trustee. So. Yeah. So this is the closest we get to sort of the audit model. Yeah. That, yeah. And and that's that was that where I was going to ask the question. And it's failed primarily because there's not a set of auditing standard. Yeah. Well, there there is actually the the uh, CPA Association or whatever. Actually, there is a set of auditing standards for privacy. So I don't think it's the lack of standards. It, it's a lack of visibility into them. Or yeah, and teeth to actually, if you're found not to comply, and um, uh, yeah. Now, I think one thing that has helped with trustees. So, um, uh, w when I was in industry and working for a company that had a trustee seal, I saw that um, companies are more careful about making changes to their privacy policy when they have trustee. Because basically, you know, we had a privacy policy. We'd gone through the whole certification process. Then somebody comes in and said, I've got this great idea for this new service we can offer, but we'll have to change our privacy policy. And it's like, whoa, wait, you know, if we change our privacy policy, we have to get recertified. So let's take some time to think about this before we just willy-nilly change our privacy policy. So I mean, I think it has overall improved privacy practices in companies, but I don't think it's done everything that people thought it would be able to do. 
Okay, um, lots of people have suggested that privacy icons are the solution to many of the problems we've talked about. Uh, on the left is a set that was developed by Mozilla, by actually a very good designer um, at Mozilla. Um, and I'm telling you, he, he's a very good designer because I think these are actually pretty terrible. Um, and, um, and it's not because the designer was no good. It's because it's a really hard problem to, privacy is not something that we have good visuals for. Um, and I think it's very difficult to convey. And especially if you decide that there are like over 15 different privacy concepts you want to have unique icons for, uh, I think that's really hard. Um, the ones on the right, uh, also, I think the, 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 these were developed by, at the time they were students, but one went on to be a professional designer. Um, yeah, they're, they're nice, but I just can't see websites showing you this like group of like eight icons and it being really any better than the 20 base privacy policy, right? Like, it's just, it, it's too much there. And I think without the words next to them, they're, they're pretty much useless. Um, but people keep trying to come up with privacy icon sets. Um, so this was a project we did at CMU uh, to have a privacy label. This was inspired by nutrition labels. And the concept here is that if you eat, we can standardize um, in something that you can put side by side and compare. Then, um, then we can make it a lot faster. People can learn how to use it. Um, you know, we're not all born knowing what cholesterol is, but um, <laughs> once we find out what it is, and especially if our doctor tells us that we have to watch it, we can very easily learn where to find it on a nutrition label, and we can compare products and see how it goes. Um, so that's what we would imagine um, for, for uh, these privacy nutrition labels. Um, this one uh, w was actually designed through an iterative design process with lots of user testing. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do is to make it very glanceable. So you can see that the one on the left like, collects a lot more data and does a lot more stuff with it than the one on the right. Even if you don't, can't even read the, the text, you can see it's darker. There's more going on there. Um, so uh, that was something we, we put out. Um, uh, no, it's not used. Um, th there's a handful of companies that actually asked me if they could use it. I was like, sure. And they're, you know, they're obscure, small companies, whatever, have used it. But it, it, it's not out there uh, other than you know, the, the idea is out there, and, and it's been tested in the research lab. Um, this is real. Th these are financial privacy notices. Um, so. The, uh, the, um, th this was a project of the nine federal agencies that have some jurisdiction over financial companies. And they got together and commissioned um, the design of this standard um, financial services privacy notice. It's not mandatory, um, but there are some incentives for banks to use it, such that most American banks voluntarily are using it. These are two different banks. You can see the, the template is basically the same. They're allowed to change the color and the fonts and whatever, but they, they all have these tables in them. Um, we actually did a big study of this. We, we screen scraped like 6,000 of these things, um, found lots of errors in them. Um, they're pretty good, but there's a lot of things that, you know, if I were designing them, I would design um, very differently. Um, but since we screen scraped them, we put that up in a uh, database on our website, and we made it searchable. And um, we discovered that actually, what's more important than having all the metadata is being able to search the metadata. Because the problem is, is I looked up my bank, and they were terrible. And then you know I, I looked up the bank down the street, and they were terrible. And what I really want to do is find the good bank you know, within a two mile radius of my house, or whatever. And I want to be able to run that search. Um, so this website lets you run that search, or at least it did as of you know, five years ago when we collected the data. The data is now all out of date on it. But, but um, that was the idea. Uh, it also allowed us to look for trends. Um, is it the case that basically all banks are terrible? Or is it only the ones on my zip code? Um, and we were able to see that there, there actually is some diversity in what 
what uh, policies different banks have. Um, there are different types of banks, uh, you know, savings and loans versus you know commercial banks, whatever. That tend to have different types of policies. And we have a paper on that as well. Okay, so I showed you a bunch of ideas, um, but uh, are any of them any good? How, how do we know if these alternate approaches are actually effective? Um, well, it, it's the, the, we start with, you know, what do we mean effective? And as I mentioned, the, the Department of Commerce Committee couldn't agree on what it was they should actually test. So there are a lot of things that we might be interested in. The first thing is if we have some sort of privacy notice, does anybody even notice that it's there? Have we put it somewhere that someone will even know where to find it? All right, assuming they can find it, is anybody going to stop and read it? Or if it's an icon, like focus their eyes on it? And if they do that, will they understand what they're reading or looking at? And if they do understand it, will they decide that the information it's conveying is actually answering questions they actually had? It's something they want to know? And does it actually impact their decision making or their behavior? You know, will, will they choose to either <laughs> will they choose to either stop using it or to continue using it, but say, "I feel good about using this because I know my privacy is actually being." Um, so, when we do evaluations, we we want to look at some or all of these questions in order to figure out whether a, a, a new type of notice is, is effective. And this is not just privacy policies. You could say this about any type of consumer disclosure. Um, and in fact, when I spent a year at the Federal Trade Commission in 2016, um, and I was very interested in privacy policies and wanted to do a big thing about privacy policies, and, um, and I talked to other people at the FTC, and they're like, you know, we do all sorts of consumer protection, not just privacy, and I discovered that some of the other types of consumer disclosures the FTC worries about have exactly the same problems privacy notices have as far as nobody understands them. Like, do any of you understand, like, dry cleaning tag labels? Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so uh, we had a big workshop called Putting Disclosures to the Test, and we invited people, researchers, who were studying the effectiveness of disclosures. So we had people looking at the effectiveness of like Energy Star labels and drug fact labels and all different kinds of consumer labels. And these people didn't know each other for the most part. They were all publishing in different places. They were not talking to each other. And we got them together, and they all said exactly the same thing, which is really cool. Yeah. A couple of years ago, I heard one of them, I kept the lady uh, at Harvard Law School, she came from the head of the FTC, and one of the biggest issues was reducing the legalese, because my friends who are lawyers, they don't even read yeah. this, this stuff, so the people who have the training do, obviously, near civilians, I don't know if they're still working on that as a way. Yeah, yeah, no, there, there, there are some projects about that as well, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, the, everything we did in this workshop is available on the FTC's website, um, including videos, transcripts, and the report that I wrote at the end of it. Um, but I think the two biggest takeaways from it were one is that if you want to know if it's usable, you actually have to test it. It is not enough to just have some smart people look at it and go, well, it looks good to me. Um, you know, really, you need to test. And the biggest pushback on testing is we don't have the time or money to do it. Um, and while, yeah, it might be very expensive to go with the gold standard of testing, um, even on a low budget and without much time, you, you know, even putting it in front of 10 people who are not you, you can actually learn about, a lot about it. <clears throat> and then the second one is that when you test things, you need to test comprehension in context. So it's one thing for me to take something out of context, show it to you while you're sitting down in the nice air-conditioned room with your coffee and say, so what do you think of this notice? Oh, yeah, I like it. Looks good, right? But it's another thing to test it you know, while people are doing tasks not related to privacy on a website and kind of see how, how it actually works in context. Or some of the other things, you know, the drug fact labels, uh, they <coughs> talked about, you know, it's not enough that a consumer can tell me what everything on the label means. I, they give people scenarios like, it's midnight, your six-year-old has a fever, you grab this off the shelf, is it safe to give it to your six-year-old? 
to a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're you're kind of hitting on it. My question is how these people think about like when you're tested, like what is the outcome? Like comprehension is one. How do they know? Like how do we know the disclosure they're doing and what they're supposed to do? Yeah. So so we. We have a variety of metrics, um, and we, we can tell you the outcome of the metrics. The question is, is it good enough? Um, and you know, so I can tell you, well, uh, you know, 59% of people correctly answered this question. Is 59% good enough? I don't know. Um, what I heard from the drug people is they have a sliding scale. If it's a question about something that if you get it wrong, you might get an upset stomach, then yeah, 60% might be good enough. If it's a question where if you get it wrong, it will kill you, then that's not good enough, right? <laughs> you know? And they have a sliding scale based on that. I don't know where the line should be in privacy disclosures. That was something when I was at the FTC, I kind of floated, and yes, he has not taken a position on I know, where, where that, that should be. OK, so um, knowing that, uh, let me show you another example of a project we did at CMU. This one also goes back a number of years. Um, so uh, first of all, we, we built a search engine that had privacy meters. So those green <coughs> boxes um, down the left side uh, are privacy, privacy meters. So you can see for each, each of your search results uh, how good the privacy is. Um, and this was actually generated automatically based on some computer-readable privacy policies and all of that. Um, and we wanted to know if people saw this in search engines, would they use it? Would it actually change their purchase behavior? And this is an example of a search engine that shows you not only privacy, but on the right side you see price. Um, so uh, we, we did a series of studies um, where we had people come to our lab and we showed them the search engine and we had them buy stuff and uh, we told them what to buy uh, and we basically gave them money for coming and they had to buy whatever the items and if they, um, if, if they bought a real cheap item, they got to keep the change. So there was some incentive for them to buy cheap items, but they were also using <coughs> their credit card, so there was some incentive to buy from a site with good privacy. Um, and so it looked like this. Uh, we realized uh, quickly that um, it, this, was, this was hard to do. These were real websites. We, we did not, like, I mean, it was in our lab, but these were real, real world websites. It was, it was very hard to control this experiment. But fortunately, nobody ever looks past, like, the first four hits when they do a web search. So, um, I mean, there's data on that. And, the drop off after the first four is, is, is uh, drops off rapidly. Um, so we only worried about controlling the first four. And so uh, these were actual web searches, but whatever search results came back, we swapped out the first four and put in our first four. Um, and, um, and we selected companies in a very particular way. So we had, we had multiple conditions, three conditions here. So the first condition, we have these privacy uh, policies, with privacy reports. And in the next condition, it was exactly the same, except instead of saying privacy report, it says handicapped accessibility. Um, which was something we had pre-tested to know that nobody cares about in the, this context. Um, and um, then we, uh, we also had uh, a condition with no information other than the price information that you have there. Um, we set it up so that the worst privacy was the first link. And as you go down to the fourth link, you had the best privacy. And we also set it up so that the lowest price was the first one. And as you go down to the fourth one, it was the highest price. Okay, so which one, in, in, in the one that's on the top with no information, where are people going to buy that product? First one, right. We stack the deck so that people would buy from the first one. It's, you know, people tend to go from the first one anyway, and it's the cheapest. So that is, of course, what they're going to do. We, we also are aware that of brand effects, if it's a well-known brand, people will skip the first one and go to the well-known brand. So we made sure that the well-known brands did not show up on the first page of search results so that we wouldn't have that problem. All right. So, um, so yeah, so we set it up like this. Um, and, uh, and so we were, particularly information, we were particularly wondering, so in the no information condition, uh, we expect people will go to the first one. And if they have that privacy information, will they go to the fourth one? And um, what we found is, yes, they will. Um, not 
every single person, but substantial, statistically significant numbers of people will actually go to the fourth one. Um, so uh, that gives us uh, some hope that actually when you make privacy super easy, people will do it and they will even pay, it, it comes up to like 65 cents more for their Duracell batteries um, uh, to have the good privacy. Um, so uh, that, that was an interesting finding. We also did a study where we had both batteries and sex toys to have privacy sensitive items and um, as you might expect, we had a larger effect for the privacy sensitive items. Um, so that, that was also pretty interesting. Yeah, it's a sex toy. <laughs> um, yeah, my lab is lots of fun. <laughs> Did these subjects have any idea of how different the privacy policies of these four uh, websites were, except for the sort of stars? Because what I'm thinking is, in you know, in online reviews, for example, all our um, uh, online service professionals have 4.5 stars and above. <laughs> and so companies are going to sort of bunch at the top of these of these ratings. Um, yeah, so so I don't know what the real world is like. I, yeah. we, we, this was an experiment that we concocted. You know, we picked four sites that had four different mm -hmm policies. And like slightly different and that was enough to put like um, we, we, we actually, behind it, there's, there, we, there's actually a pretty rigorous thing. We, we actually had a set of criteria that we used to score websites and we found sites that were not slightly different but were actually dramatically different. Okay. Um, and which, which actually made it even harder to do the experiment because we had to go through a lot of sites to find the set yeah. that had the right kind of pricing and had these different things. And then actually in that follow-up study, what we found in this study, sometimes they changed their price in the middle of our study because they didn't even know they were part of our study. Right? Um, so for the follow-up study, we actually let the, the sites know that we were using them as part of our study and asked them not to change their price. Um, but in some of them, we couldn't find the right combination to get them to cooperate, and so we asked them to change their price to fit our study. Um, and so there were some that were like, you know, could you raise your price 10 cents or whatever? And these were all small companies, so, so some of them did. Um, but one of my students actually had to call a large number of sex toy vendors to get their cooperation. Um, and, uh, and there was one that we needed them to lower their price. And so my student said, well, well, we'll pay you to lower your price. And so at the end of the study, we owed the sex toy company like $100. And I had to get my university to cut them a check. Yeah. <laughs> so they invoiced us for research project assistance. <laughs> yeah. so, this is very interesting. So I saw a lot of search engine already incorporate a security notice, right? Like this website is all high risk. So are there a lot of search engine also incorporating the privacy uh, notice at this stage? No, no. So this this is entirely our research yeah, no, project. But I'm just curious about the practice in the um, in the field. Are there a lot? Because this seems to be with the GDPR and like privacy concern. I, I mean, all privacy all search engines have privacy notices for themselves, but they're not putting the sort of labels on on their search results. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to move on. Um, so uh, another project we're doing right now is to try to, uh, so I, I mentioned our, our machine learning on privacy policies didn't work great, but we did event, we were eventually able to use it to find opt-outs in, so find where the privacy policy talked about opt-outs and figure out what kinds of things you can opt out of. And so we built this browser plugin that, um, that can find the opt-outs and privacy policies and will jump you right there um, so you can find out how to opt-out. All right, so uh, from what you've seen from the, some of these projects is we can do a lot more with automation. Um, there's a lot of value to being able to automate things. Um, but in order to do this, we either need to have uh, machine-readable data or we need to create machine-readable data. And because not much machine-readable data on privacy policies exists in the world, we've had to screen scrape it and, uh, and do all sorts of automated analysis, which is not perfect and is time-consuming. It would be much better if we could convince companies to just give us machine-readable data on their privacy policies in the first place. It's just something I've been trying to get companies to do for 20 years now. And was part of a standards effort, um, W3C standards effort, um, which 
was a great effort, except that it failed. Um, and, uh, so, uh, but it's interesting that I recently, I keep hearing from people who are like, oh, we should have machine readable privacy policies. And yeah, we should. Um, so uh, I, I, think that, I think this would actually really help with the scaling of privacy policies. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about IoT. So, um, as I mentioned, lots of IoT devices where it's not easy to display a privacy policy. Um, and so people say, well, you don't need the policy, you just need like a light flashing or sound playing. So, you know, as the number of IoT devices increases, like this, this is the world that we will have. Like everything's flashing and beeping and we have a whole like cacophony when you walk into a room and you're like, some data is being collected but I have no idea what. So an alternative might be that they silently send a signal to my watch or my phone to tell me about their data collection. And so that's a project we're doing at CMU. We're trying to build what we're calling a personal privacy assistant um, that would be built into your watch or your phone or whatever and is listening for those signals and then should do something useful with them. What could it do? Well, it could vibrate to tell you that something particularly bad is about to happen, um, or it could automatically opt you out of things. It could signal to that video camera to blur your face, uh, all sorts of things like that. And we're doing research to try to figure out what would users actually want, what do they want to be notified about, what kind of controls do they want to have. Um, here's um, uh, kind of the lit, I don't know if it's absolutely, but one of the recent mock-ups that students came up with. So this is, um, we have a test bed at CMU, and you can walk around campus with your phone and find out what devices are around you. And most of the devices are like these research projects that in the School of Computer Science are like in the hallway. There, you know, the, this um, this visual data. Like, I walk down the hall every morning, and I see myself in, on on the screen in skeletal form. And um, so, basically, you know, you can see what is around you. You can click on it. You can find out, you know, what it is, uh, who runs it, um, what types of data they're collecting, what they're going to use it for. Uh, so, this is kind of an, an early prototype of of what this would actually look like. Um, you know, this is just deployed at CMU, but imagine if this was deployed in the world and you could, you know, wherever you go, if you want to know what's going on, you could, and you could set your phone to, you know, collect that data, but uh, interrupt you if there's something particularly um, bad going on. Okay. So another problem with IoT devices is, <laughs> is that, um, <laughs> They, they do offer some convenience and people like buy them for their homes all the time. Um, and yet, then they hear on the news that there are problems and so like I want a smart doorbell but I don't want the bad one. And like how do I find which is the good one and which is the bad one? Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so I might go shopping online to buy an IoT device and I might, you know, scroll through all the information and look for the security and privacy information. And um, uh, I have spent a lot of time doing that and you can see there's all sorts of useful information but there is absolutely nothing here about security and privacy. Um, so maybe the problem is, is that I shouldn't shop online. I should actually go to a brick and mortar store to buy my devices. So we tried that too. My student actually went to a store and took these pictures. And you know, she went and she looked on, here's two sides of the box, nothing about security and privacy. Two more sides, nothing about security and privacy. Here's the last two, nothing about security and privacy. So no information online, no information in the store. Basically, no information. And it's not that this particular device is particularly bad. It's pretty much all the devices, this is, this is what you will find. So um, we uh, said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was something like a nutrition label actually on the box of your smart device? So we did this mock-up here, and uh, we wrote a paper um, that was with basically user interviews. We talked to users and said, would you like this? Would you use it? How would you use it? What do you want to see on it? And we got a lot of really positive feedback from users that yes, this is something they could actually use. We found out what, what things they're interested in, not interested in. But most importantly, what we found out is that 
users um, don't know what they don't know. So people are like, yeah, I want any privacy and security information, but I don't know what's important because I'm not an expert. Um, so I really want an expert to tell me what's important here. Yeah. Did you discuss at all the fact that like, all these things get pushed firmware updates and stuff, and that could change everything and having on the box? Yeah, well, so the idea is that it should be both on the box and online. And so you'll see there's a QR code on there, and you can get the latest version on the QR code. Yeah, yeah, all those things. Um, so uh, we did an expert study, um, and we talked to about two dozen experts, and we asked them what should be on the label. Um, and we redesigned it. Only the thing is, um, this, this, is uh, this is part of what they told us should be on the label, but actually there was a lot more than that. There was so much that they thought should be on the label, about 50 different things, that they're not going to fit on the box. And it probably is going to overwhelm those consumers. So what we did is we split it into two labels. So uh, what you see on the left side is what we imagine would be on the box. Um, or on the first page when you see it on Amazon or whatever. And then when you click the URL or scan the QR code, then you get the full detailed label that has everything. Um, and then uh, and it says it has a date and a firmware version, and of course you, it would update uh, with it. And there's some of the things on the full label that are actually URLs that link to places with more detailed information. Uh, so this is our latest version. This is still a work in progress. You can go to our website where we have um, the, the, you will always find the latest version and all our papers. Um, we're, we're actually analyzing data from another consumer study right now um, where we, we found that consumers actually understand a lot of this stuff um, and it, it uh, impacts their perception of risk in the right direction. Um, for, for the most part, there were a couple of things where it did not and we're like, okay, that's, that's the thing they don't understand. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think this is interesting stuff. Um, we are, uh, oh yeah, here, here's some from our, we did some lab studies. We actually like put these on boxes and handed them to participants in our lab as we did the study. So this is, you know, looking at it kind of in context. Um, the person on the right was asked, you know, if you were trying to decide between these two products, which one would you buy and why? And so they're, they're debating that. Um, uh, this was just for fun. This is my kitchen. Um, <laughs> one, one, one of my chairs is the Bosch chair, and um, so the Bosch people came to CMU, and I had to give them a presentation. And so, to be funny, I put the, I put our our uh, label on on a Bosch dishwasher for them. They really liked it. <laughs> um, all right, but uh, we've been talking about right. Once we finalize this, how can we get this out into the world? Um, and uh, there's actually talk in Congress about mandating security and privacy labels, usually more security than privacy. Um, and uh, most of this proposed legislation does not actually have any details. It just says there should be a security label, and they might like ask the Department of Commerce to figure out what it is or something. Um, so we've started talking to some of the congressional staff to say, hey, we have an idea of what this should look like. Um, and we're also talking to Consumer Reports um, because they have started getting interested in IoT devices and doing evaluation of IoT devices as part of uh, their evaluation, it look, especially looking at the security and privacy. So when they evaluate refrigerators or dishwashers, if they have um, internet connectivity, they want to actually evaluate security and privacy too, not just how well it washes or cools or whatever. Um, so we're, we're looking for partners, um, uh, we're starting to talk to companies to see if we can find companies that would like to, you know, pilot this on, on their, their products. Um, okay, I want to move on to the last bit, which is privacy choices for websites. Um, so uh, we've been looking at the part of the privacy policy that talks about how to make choices, how to opt out of things. And we did a study where my students had to read 150 website privacy policies, um, which is painful, uh, and look for three particular things. Um, opt-outs of email communication, opt-outs of targeted ads, and choices for data deletion. Um, and this, this was joint work uh, between my students and Florian Schaub's uh, students at the University of Michigan. <coughs> So we wanted to know what choices were actually available on websites in these three areas. 
and how the websites were presenting these choices um, and any usability issues that users might encounter when trying to exercise these choices. So what we did is uh, our research assistants first visited the home page of a company. They, um, they, they went and uh, created an account. They visited the privacy policy and they visit the account settings. And each of these places, so these four places, they look for any information about opting out of any of these three things. And they recorded it in great detail, including how many clicks, how many swipes, how many forms they had to fill out, everything. So we have lots of data. Um, yeah, location, level of detail of what you can opt out of. Um, they also clicked on all the relevant links and recorded whether they were like broken links or whether they actually went. We found a surprisingly large number of broken links to opt out. Um, we, we also looked at, uh, uh, you know, what other interactions you had to do. Uh, we looked to see if some things had like multiple links that took you to different places and then you wondered like, did I opt out of the same thing at each of these places or was it something different? Uh, how did we pick our 150 websites? Well, we did English language websites and we used Alexa's global top 10,000 sites, but we didn't want to just use the top 150 because we wanted to see whether there were differences depending on how popular. So we sampled 50 from the top 200, 50 from 201 to 5,000, and 50 from basically 5,000 to 10,000 to give, give you uh, three tiers of popularity. Um, all right, so here are a few uh, things. There's a long paper with lots of data, but just a few uh, things. Um, so you can see that most websites have a choice about all three of these things. Um, data deletion is the, the one that is least common to have, have a choice for, but they, most of them have a choice these days. Um, and some of them have choices about other things besides those three things. We, if we noticed other things, we, we, we uh, recorded that as well. Okay, we also looked at where they had their choices. And if you look at email communication, you see that most sites have it in more than one location. Generally, they have it both in their account settings page and their privacy policy. Um, if they're gonna have it only in one, it's more likely to be in the privacy policy. Um, and uh, same thing for targeted advertising and data deletion, except that they're more likely to have it just in the privacy policy. Yeah? So was this done after GDPR? Uh, and does GDPR compel uh, these? And if so, do you know if these firms were like European or not? So, so, yeah, the, these are, very few of them are European. Uh, it says in the paper how many of them were. Um, they, this was done right around when GDPR was getting adopted. And so what we did, um, most of the data co was collected before the deadline. Um, we went back and rechecked um, those that were collected before. We rechecked them, um, I think it was like two or three months after, um, to see if they'd made any changes. Uh, and most of them had not changed in that time. But, but it, these were, the caveat is that these were targeted Americans. We were coming from US IP addresses to the sites. Like there may have been changes that Europeans would have seen that, that we did not see here. So not a conclusive answer to that. Okay, we looked at readability and this is really interesting. So, um, we see that uh, all of these uh, th things require university level reading skills to understand the opt out. But interestingly, if you look at the whole privacy policy, not just the opt out part, it's 10th grade reading skills. So the opt out part, the choice part, is actually harder to read and understand than the privacy policy as a whole. Um, I mean, in some ways it's not too surprising because it's, it's actually talking about choices rather than you know, telling you we love privacy, we want to protect it, right? Um, so it kind of makes sense that this would be the harder part to read, but it's not good. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, we also thought, well, if people could just um, search for the opt-out, then it's easy. I go to the 20-page privacy policy and I search for opt-out, and I don't have to read the whole thing, I just search for it. So we looked, um, and this we, we, we wrote a computer program to look, uh, for what words accompanied the, um, the opt-out sections. 
And, um, and we were trying to find, is there are some standard words or phrases? There was no single engram that occurred in more than 20 of the 150 policies. Um, and so you can see um, your choices, your choice, something like that, what, was what appeared the most. And so you know, in about 10 uh, of each of these things, they appeared. Um, here are some from some uh, well-known companies, data deletion. The heading was your choices or data subjects rights, right? Not data deletion, all right? Um, LinkedIn, rights to access and control your personal data. Facebook, how can I manage or delete information about me? Right? So there's not one standard thing I can search for in, in their policies. Um, another theme here besides automation is good is standardization would be good. Um, okay, we found that opting out may require many actions. Um, and we looked at clicks, hovers, checkboxes, and form fields. We found the shortest path um, that you could take if there are multiple paths. On average, for email and data deletion was 5.3 clicks, hovers, checkboxes, and form fields. And for targeted um, ad opt outs, it was 3.2. Um, that was on average. We found some that were like 40 also. Um, uh, New York Times was particularly bad. If you want to delete uh, your data from the New York Times, you have to like go and, and pick things from menus and here and there, and that only deletes one kind of data, and then you have to go back and do it for another type of data. Yeah? Is there any co correlation between the popularity of the website, so the rank of the website, and the quality of their policies in sort of terms of how to navigate it? Um, no, I think the main correlation we saw is that the more popular they were, the more likely they'd actually have the choices and that they would have the choices in multiple places. But I don't think we found the quality or the, the number of clicks to be correlated. Yeah. Um, and then um, a few other things we saw. Some websites had multiple opt-outs that took you to different places. So this is Twitter. and. They have a Twitter implemented opt out, um, but they also have, um, and that, that you find on their personalization, their account settings page. Then they also have an about ads page on Twitter that has four different opt outs one from Twitter, two from uh, industry groups, the DAA and the NAI, and one from Google because they have Google ads on Twitter. Um, and then um, their privacy policy itself has even more, and they have both the Twitter implemented one and the industry one, but only one of the industry ones. Um, so it's not clear whether you need to go do all four of them or, or what, or what the difference is. Um, then there's Amazon, and this page I think has like 79 opt-outs on it. Um, and there is a check all box, but it's at the bottom, and you have to scroll down to discover. So you could be there like click, 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 until you get to the bottom and go, oh, I didn't have to click all of them. I could have just you know, found that. There you go. Um, yeah. Um, so, so this is all in theory. We found the shortest path. But what do real users do? So we did a lab study where we brought 24 people into our lab, and they had them opt out of two different things. Um, we chose nine of the websites from the original study that, that illustrated various things. We had people do it. And, um, and you can see the shortest path is fairly short, and that's the orange line. And then the blue line is how many, the average for our participants in the study. You can see is much longer. Um, so people, and the reason it took so long is people would go down the wrong path and have to click back and go another place and have to click back because they couldn't actually find these things. You know, the big problem was discoverability. They just could not find where to go to opt out. Um, okay. All right, so uh, then um, coming back to icons, and this is also going back to an old study, um, the ad industry tried to address the problem that people um, didn't know they were being tracked on ads and wanted opt-outs by saying, we're going to have this icon uh, that will signal that this is, you know, you, you click on this icon on an ad and you can opt out. Um, and we did some small scale studies and found that nobody knew what this icon was. You know, did, did any of you recognize this icon? Yeah, a, f a few people have, the side of the room hasn't. Um, <laughs> uh, so this, this triangle icon thing, um, yeah, most of the people in our studies didn't know what it was, weren't going to click on it. Um, we put that in a paper. The ad industry said, oh, you ivory tower academics, what do you know? Um, yeah, it was a small study. Uh, so we did a big study on MTurk. And um, 
basically, what we what we did, um, yeah, okay. What we did is we showed people ads that had this on it, and we varied the tagline next to it. So most of the time it has ad choices, but sometimes it says things like, why did I get this ad? And we made up a few things that we thought might actually be better. Um, so, we, so it was uh, between subject study, we tested lots of different things. We asked them questions about what they think might happen if they clicked on it. Um, so uh, for when we showed them ad choices, the people in the condition with ad choices, 56% um, thought more ads would pop up, which is wrong. 45% said it will take you to a page where you can buy advertisements on this website, which is wrong. Only 27% have the correct answer. And th they could answer yes to more than one of them, which is why it doesn't add up. Okay, so um, this is pretty bad. Uh, but we had some conditions that did better. It turned out ad choices was actually one of the worst. Um, if you do configure ad preferences, you can get the correct answer up to 50%, which is still bad, but it's a lot better than 27%. Um, we just did one round of this. We weren't trying to solve their problem. We were just trying to point out their problem. And so, you know, they're the ad industry. They know how to do A-B testing. They should be able to figure out how to come up with something better here. Okay, so this brings us to uh, the latest, which is the CCPA, which says that websites of a certain size that do business with a certain number of people in California, blah, 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 have to have a link that says, do not sell my personal information and an optional button. So the legislation says nothing about what the button should look like or anything. It just says optional button. So um, the, the California Attorney General said, um, well, we're, we're going to have to figure this out. Um, law goes into effect January 1st, but we're not going to enforce it to, jet, to July 1st to give us some uh, time to figure the rest of the details out. There are also some other details like what, what, does, what is the definition of sell that they're also trying to work out, but that aside. Um, so my lab is doing all this work on opt-out and, and user testing, so we said, well, it would be good. We're, we're about to run a, a study. We would like to test whatever it is the attorney general is thinking about using here. So I contacted the California attorney general's office and asked them what were they thinking about, and they said, um, yeah, we don't have to figure this out until July, so... Yeah, um, and, uh, and then I told them, well, we're going to do some studies. Would you like to see our research? And they said, oh, yeah, we'd love to see that. Actually, no, we do need it by February 1st, though, because we have to, um, we have to put out a draft uh, proposal, put it out for public comment. So really, by February 1st, we need to really have all the input into this. Um, and of course, we talked to them in November, and, um, and my students got very excited, and I said, but you're going to have to work over winter break to get this done if we're going to get this done by February 1st. Um, so we decided uh, that we would do some studies, and um, we started by having a design workshop to identify icon concepts. So we got a lot of students and faculty together with lots of sticky notes and whiteboards, and we looked at what would you want to convey with this button. And one idea is that you might want it to be a toggle or check boxes to show that there are privacy choices. Um, another idea is you might want to actually show kind of a checkbox in two different states that you're changing it. Um, you might want to show pictorially something withdrawing or removing to show opting out. Um, you might want to show like you can't uh, exchange something for money. You know, there, there's no no selling of personal information um, or stopping the sale of personal information. So those were kind of the best concepts we came up with. Um, and, uh, and so we, did, we got a design student to develop some icons, and we did a first round of testing on Mechanical Turk. We tested 12 icons, and we had actually 24 conditions. Half the people saw the icons with no text next to it, and half of them saw, do not sell my personal information. And so we'd show them one icon, and we asked them, what do you think this means, and what do you think would happen if you clicked on it? Um, and then we showed them all 12 and asked them, which one do you think best conveys do not sell my personal information, and which one best conveys privacy choices? All right, so these are the icons we tested. Um, so these are 11 that our uh, designer um, drew based on the, the ideation. And then the green one is the DAA. Uh, there's that ad choices thing, only the DAA recently announced that when it's green instead of blue, it's a CCPA opt-out. <laughs> okay, well, given that they put it out there, we might as well test it, right? 
Um, we love testing their stuff. Um, so, uh, so, so we ran the test. Uh, the first thing we noticed is that for the 12 conditions without any tagline, nobody had any idea. <laughs> People, they did not really convey much meaning at all without the tagline. Um, okay, we found that uh, when we asked you know, which one best conveys do not sell my personal information, the slash dollar seemed to be what best conveyed that. And when we asked people which conveys, there's an option to make choices, the toggle best conveyed that. Um, people really didn't get the arrow coming out of the hole or the folder or the box. Or, we liked them, um, but not popular with our participants. Um, people didn't really much like the stop sign, but we had a hypothesis that maybe it was because it wasn't red. If we made it red, maybe it would do better. Um, so then we did a follow-up study, um, and we, we tested just these four, um, and we made them in color this time. Um, and, um, and we chose blue for the toggle because we wanted to look neutral, not not uh, red. We also designed this toggle so it didn't look like a real toggle because we didn't want people to click on it to be like, oh, I'm going to change it. So it looks sort of like a toggle, but not quite. Okay. All right. So, oh, and, we, and we tested the green one again. So when we asked people which one best conveys, there's an option to tell websites do not sell my personal information. Again, the dollar with the slash is the winner. And you can see the stop sign, even red, did, did not win. And, and in some ways, you would think these two icons are like almost the same. They're, they're a dollar sign with stopping. And yet, there's a really strong preference for one over the other, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, when we asked which one best conveys, there's an option to make choices. Uh, the toggle is the clear winner. So now we basically have attention. We have two clear winners, depending on what you want them to convey. We decided that what we wanted them to convey was there's an option to make choices. Because do not sell my personal information is very narrow. And it's just one of many things that people can opt out of. And we don't want to have to have a separate button for everything you opt out of. It would be better to have that. So we thought that this, this is what made the most sense. Um, but you know, other people have different opinions. Um, so we, we also looked at. Um, common misinterpretations, and I, I don't have all of them here, but I just showed these, these three. Um, so we, we uh, in the free text response, we basically went through and coded, what do people think these mean? And um, the toggle, most people realized it was about accepting or declining or activating or deactivating something. Um, the DAA, uh, you know, the best we got was one person said it's something related to ads. Otherwise, people had no idea what that, what that meant. And the slash dollar, um, people knew it had something to do with money, um, but most of them thought it had not, they had no idea that it had to do with privacy or anything like that. Um, so this reinforced our, our thought that toggle icon kind of makes more sense. So then we thought, well, Let's think about alternatives to do not sell my personal information. And we came up with a bunch of different choices. And you can see some of them had personal info in them, and some had my info, and choices, and options, and opt-outs. And so we did a study testing just the taglines without the icons. Um, we found that if you just say do not sell without do not sell my personal information, people are very confused. So not a good idea. Um, we found. Um, that options and choices were more effective than opt-outs. And anyway, based on that, we narrowed down a set of kind of better options. And we went back to the toggle, the dollar sign, and the DAA icon. And then we did a big combined study. So in the combo test, we did it in context. So we made up this website for footwear. And we actually put it at the bottom of the website. And this is what it looked like in our survey. So we've got the close-up so that people could actually see it. And we say, what do you think would happen if you clicked on this? Um, so uh, we tested 23 combinations here. And um, we found uh, a lot of misconceptions. Um, in context, people thought personal information choices related to things about shoe sizes and payments and credit cards and things like that. I mean, some people got it correct, but there was a lot of confusion. Um, 
The slash dollar, uh, a small number of people thought it had something to do with encryption and payments. Um, and a very small number, only six people thought that the toggle icon actually was a toggle that you could interact with. But it was only six out of, um, in that condition, like 300 something. Um, none of them were very good without a tagline. The slash dollar was the worst without a tagline. Um, and we found that if you had the tagline, the icon made very little difference. It was the tagline that people were mostly paying attention to. So this is what we recommended last Monday. And you can find our recommendation on the California Attorney General's website. They published it there along with a list of um, all the other documents they relied on, about a quarter of which were from our research group, which was cool. Um, so we said, of these choices, you should use the blue toggle icon with privacy options rather than do not sell my personal information. Sadly, do not sell my personal information is actually in the law. It would require them to change the law, I think, to change the privacy options. But we wanted to get that out there. Um, and um, uh, so that, that's what we recommended. And then on Friday, they announced their proposed regulation. And it was this. Hmm. And you see ours on the left there, okay. And we're like, huh, that's, that's interesting. They, they took some of our advice. Um, it's not a dollar sign with a X over it. It's, it's a toggle thing. Um, that's interesting. And then Twitter responded. And th these are not just like random Twitter people, by the way. Um, th these are some people in the know. Um, and um, yeah, we, we were kind of like, th these are kind of confusing. Um, and you know, my instinct is that what we actually recommended maybe was a bit better than what they chose. Um, but you know, I don't want to say that until we test it. So right now, my students are running the test. <laughs> and um, stay tuned, um, and uh, we will find out. We, we will submit a public comment once we have the answer. Um, let you know uh, what, what we find here. Um, so let, let me, let me uh, wrap up, and then I'll take final questions. OK, so uh, my, my final thoughts here. Um, privacy, notice, and consent today are largely failing. They're failing consumers. IoT is making it worse. The proliferation of lots of devices collecting your data is making it worse. We need standardized disclosures and choice mechanisms. I mean, without some standardization, it's just too hard and time consuming. But even better, we need machine readable so that we can have automation here. Um, and whatever we do, we need to evaluate it and find out if it actually works. Um, and I will leave you with this picture of a bunch of my students who actually do this work. So. Yes? So uh, uh, a lot of companies, by default, they create uh, super long privacy uh, policies because they know that that will deter their consumers from reading those policies <laughs> and help them have more revenues. So do you actually think that in a highly competitive uh, landscape, uh, companies will be willing to uh, disclose those privacy policies on their products? Um, OK, so you made an assumption in your question, which may or may not be true, which is that companies are making long privacy policies on purpose so that people won't read them. Um, uh, I'm sure there are some companies that do that. But I think most companies are making long privacy policies because they want to um, make sure they have themselves legally covered for yeah, lots of things and, and not to prevent people from using them. Um, uh, but will companies be willing to do something different? I don't know. Um, I think it, a lot of it depends on incentives from regulation. So the banks all did something different because the regulation basically gave them a safe harbor for using the short notice. And so with that safe harbor, okay, you know, they'll go ahead and do that. In the absence of any, um, anything like that, uh, you know, any regulation that gives some advantage to doing this or requires them to do it, um, no, I don't think anything will change. Yes. So under CCPA, um, if someone clicks on the toggle, do not sell my information, that only means that the third party cookies cannot be sold. But it doesn't stop a platform like Google from collecting and analyzing the data. 
It, it, it does not say do not collect my information. It does not say do not analyze. It just says do not sell, yes. Um, which is part of the reason why we said it's too narrow. There are other things you'd want to opt out of besides that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one question, like you mentioned about the regulation as one incentive for firm to adopt the um, better design or better communication. Do you think there's also a potential demand side uh, approach to this? Meaning, like if consumer really cares about privacy, like and firm wants to gain a competitive advantage, so they could try their own way to kind of improve the communication and try to like help assure consumer about privacy. I mean, do you think that route is feasible or like you think privacy is not valuable enough for the consumer to put well, the some, pressure on that? Some firms are trying to do that, most famously Apple. Um, anybody see an Apple ad recently? They, there are quite a few Apple ads lately that really focus on privacy. Um, so some, some companies are trying that. I don't think it's widespread. I, I you know, can't think of a lot of companies that are trying that. Um, uh, so yeah, I think, I think the jury's still out as to whether that's going to be a winning strategy or not. Last question. Uh, just on the CCPA, I'm curious about, say, I'll pick two random companies and their, how their, what's their stance on it, um, Google and Facebook. What about them? Uh, how have they treated the CCPA? Are they opposing it, wanting to fight it tooth and nail? Are they accommodating it? How, what is their I, corporate I don't, stance? I don't actually know. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah. Okay, please thank. Uh, join me.